First of all, I want to begin by talking about Advents, which might seem off topic, but we'll circle back to, to Latin in a sec. So you think back to Advent, which is obviously the season before Christmas. Advent carries with it a certain kind of confusion amongst the people of God, typically speaking. So it doesn't help in a certain sense that Advent has the same color as, as Lent, right? And so people think, is it a penitential season? Is it not? What do I do? Also, Advent is lacking those three things, like the prayer, fasting, and the almsgiving. So a lot of times, people look at Advent and it's just like, what do I do? They might know it's a time of preparation, but then what does that mean? Do I live in tension? Like, what does it mean to actually prepare? Now, if you think back to Advent, certainly there are certain readings, especially in the Gospel, which are meant to kind of help in this regard. You know, so you think about, you know, the Gospel of Matthew chapter 13, all those parables. Parable of the sower, parable of the leavened bread, the parable of the weeds and the weeds, and so on and so forth, right? And so, based on that, okay, so I'm supposed to focus, for example, on a few things the Lord wants me to do carefully and well. Guard my heart, don't be worried, don't be afraid, and trust that over time, the kingdom of heaven will emerge victorious in my heart. But at the same time, when it comes to like the actual application of these principles to my concrete life, I need to be creative, I need to be practical. And there's no way I can abdicate that particular responsibility. That's what makes Advent kind of challenging, but at the same time kind of interesting, right? So again, I'm aware of these principles articulated, for example, in the gospel, but then the idea is how am I called to bring these things to bear to receive the grace of Advent, mindful that Advent means coming in presence. So mindful of the fact that Christ is coming, Christ is already present, how do I dispose myself to receive God's transformative grace? That's the spirit of Advent. Now you hold that thought and you think about Lent. And on the one hand, it's like, oh, Lent's pretty easy, prayer, fasting, and almsgiving, right? But not so fast, not so fast. You think about the Code of Canon Law, right? So the Code of Canon Law with regards to Lent specifies certain kind of dietary things. So for example, Ash Wednesday, Good Friday, fasting and abstinence, which I'm sure you're all aware of by this time, right? So there's that. But in terms of like the rest of it, it's kind of interesting. The Code of Canon Law does not have really strict obligations or exhortations beyond those dietary things in terms of what you're supposed to do during a season of Lent. So what do you do? What do you do? To realize that the church in general always warns us against a sense of legalism. There's a reason why there's all those stories up and down the gospel involving the scribes and the Pharisees and why Jesus Christ is so angry at these people whenever they try to reduce the Catholic thing or the Jewish faith to a certain legalism. We're called to recognize that within ourselves. There's always this tendency to reduce the Christian thing to like just certain rules and regulations. To abdicate this responsibility to be creative, to be practical, to think about how I'm called in particular in my uniqueness to collaborate with God's other designs. So as you know, when it comes to Lent, it's easy to fall into this thing where Okay, there's the prayer and the fasting and the almsgiving. So I pick something for each of those categories. So maybe I pray a decade of the rosary, I give to share life, and I give up chocolate. Insofar as I can keep it up for 40 days, good Lent. Insofar as I can, bad Lent. You gotta remind yourself the whole point of Lent is to look more like Christ at the end of the 40 days. The whole point of the season of Lent is to look more like Christ at the end of the 40 days. So again, to be creative, to think about what can I do practically speaking to look more like Christ at the end of the 40 days. So I want to give you some practical tips in this regard. If you want to look more like Christ at the end of the 40 days, there are certain things that just make sense you should do, right? So I should habitually put myself in the presence of the one living and true God. I should bring into my life certain habits of love, certain habits of self gifts And I should kind of build into my routine no in favor of get or yes across the whole spectrum of like things that i could be doing and what is that but prayer fasting and almsgiving right but you can't stop there you got to bring a certain kind of practicality to it right so again just to think it through right let's say for example you struggle with pride which is like everybody right so what do you do with that a lot of times even if you fly that it's like okay i struggle with the daily sin of pride so what do i do going forward i try not to be prideful <laughs> okay now think of it in terms of the way to work against a particular sin is to cultivate the opposite virtue. So what's the opposite thing with regards to pride? It's humility. Even when it comes to humility, we're a little bit confused. How do I cultivate humility? I just try to be humble? Like, what is that, right? To think about humility in terms of not living in my mind, but being present to reality. So to work against the deadly sin of, of pride, which is the primordial sin, how can I cultivate the virtue of humility? 
One way to do it is to be fully present to life as it comes to you. So even though this might sound kind of strange, it's not strictly penitential, something that can really help in this regard is to carve out a certain amount of time for each day where you're just enjoying your life. Right? So I'm working against the deadly sin of pride. I'm trying to cultivate the virtue of humility. Something that could be really helpful is to take, for example, a half hour where you're just walking down the street, smelling the flowers, feeling the air in your face, and just enjoying life. Again, it's not super hard. It's not overtly penitential, but it really helps. Because what you're cultivating is a spirit of like noticing and receiving and allowing your heart to be transformed by this unexpected grace, which I didn't generate, I didn't expect, but is there nonetheless, right? And when you do that, again, you're cultivating the virtue of humility and working against the deadly sin of pride. So there's that. Another thing I want to say, this is kind of like the last thing I want to focus on, right? If you want to become more like Christ at the end of the 40 days, Realize that ultimately it's God's project. Because a lot of times what happens when it comes to land, we kind of make it our project. And certainly God wants you to collaborate with his self epic designs, but if you look back in the 40 days and you say, well, look, I, I made myself holy, or I made myself look more like Christ, something was, was off in terms of your overall approach, right? So I'll give you an example. So you think about Holy Week, you think about Holy Thursday, right? So you think about the disciples at the Last Supper. So St. Peter, before all the disciples, says to the Lord, look, even if all these losers deny you, Lord, I will never deny you. And everyone's like, gosh, I should have said that. So they all start saying the same thing, right? And remember what happens after that. So immediately after that, Peter denies the Lord three times. And then Jesus Christ suffers and dies on the cross, and then he comes back from the dead. Now, it's a timing issue, right? So Jesus Christ comes back from the dead, I think if I recall correctly, he appears first of all to two disciples and wrote to Emmaus. Then he appears to the disciples minus St. Thomas. Then he appears to all the disciples, including St. Thomas. But then all this time, he hasn't had that conversation with St. Peter. And that's really kind of important to know. So he comes back to the dead and there's this lag time of about like two weeks before he talks to St. Peter. And imagine you're St. Peter, like you're kind of dreading this conversation. This conversation is not going to go well. He called me to be the first pope. You are Peter, and on this rock I shall found my church. I'm the one who boasted at the Last Supper. I would never deny him. And so when he talks to me, after coming back from the dead, he is going to chew me out. I no longer call you as pope. That goes to James. <laughs> Something like that, right? And so he's bracing himself. He's bracing himself. But you remember the conversation, right? Some variation of like three times. Simon, son of John, do you love me? Simon, son of John, do you love me? Simon, son of John, do you love me? Now, in the English, there's only one word for love, and that, of course, is love. But in the Greek, there's a little something, something. So in the Greek, there's four words for love. So eros, sexual love, desire for union, right? Philios love, friendship love. Storge love, sort of like a mother and son thing. I love you because I have to. And on top of that, there's agape love, self-gift, perfect love, godlike love. I totally give of myself to you because I love you, because I'm unselfishly seeking your, your good, right? So there's that. Now you keep that in mind, you think back to the story, right? So how it goes is, Simon, son of John, do you love me with agape love more than all the rest? Simon, son of John, do you love me with perfect, self-giving, godlike love more than all the rest of these people? Now you know St. Peter, at the Last Supper, he would have said, for sure. Even if all these people deny you, I will never deny you, Lord. But Peter now, in the aftermath of his betrayal, his threefold denial, his answer is different. So what he says is, Lord, I only love you with filios love. I only love you with friendship love. Lord asks him again, Simon, son of John, do you love me with agape love? Again, perfect, self-giving love. Not more than all the rest, but still, pretty high standard. Again, Peter says, you know I only love you with friendship love. And then the Lord changes it. Simon, son of John, do you love me only with friendship love? And the gospel says Peter was hurt. Lord, you know all things. You know I only love you with friendship love. I thought I was this, but I'm actually that. And now I am bracing myself for your rejection. I feel shame. I feel shame and I fully expect all the old promises don't apply anymore, and someone else will be picked as Pope. But instead, what you hear is, feed my lambs, tend my sheep, 
feed my sheep. Right? All the old promises still apply. And in fact, now you're ready for the mantle of leadership, whereas before you were not. You think about it, that guy at the Last Supper, if he became Pope, oh my goodness, poor church. What's the message? Like, you know, here's the, the gospel, the message of like love and mercy, which you losers need, but I don't because I'm awesome. Right? Ooh, what a terrible Pope he would have been, you know? But now here's this guy, the message of love and mercy. It, it's not an, an arm's length thing. It's not this abstract concept. Here's the Lord who has loved me in spite of myself. And now because of his grace, but also because of my awareness of, of my weakness and my frailty, I'm acutely aware of the fact that, again, the Lord loves me in spite of myself. And because of that, I'm not acting out of a space of pride or arrogance. I'm acting out of a space of gratitude. Let me show you how much the Lord loves you as he has loved me. So that whole thing, you know, love others as I have loved you, forgive others as I have forgiven you, now just has this whole new meaning, right? I own this thing in my bones. The thing I want to impress upon you is that you look back on that. Okay, so what does that mean for St. Peter? Was that a good Lent? You bet. <laughs> but it didn't play out the way that he expected. So a lot of times we do that, right? So what's a good Lent? I, I make up my own rules, structures and habits and routines, and, and I, I keep it up over the course of the 40 days, and then like, that's a good Lent. No, what's going to happen? You begin Lent, and certain things you should do, the prayer, the fasting, and the almsgiving, you make certain resolutions, but here's what's gonna happen. You're gonna discover your life is difficult. Your plans come to ruin, your expectations are thwarted, and you encounter all sorts of circumstances which expose the truth about who you are and your relationship with God, which perhaps might be kind of embarrassing and, and shameful. But to realize when the Lord does these things, it's, it's not to, have you stay there, but to realize these are the areas I want you to become strong in. Because I call you the great things. And so the whole idea is that when you come to the end of Lent, there might be a certain growth in humility because now I'm aware of my, my weakness and frailty, whereas perhaps I wasn't. But then you are ready, not like St. Peter, to become a real witness and leader of the church.